Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Now, there are certain years that are very important to all of us, and we can date certain events in our life by the year in which they happened. 1962, that was the year I was born. 1967, the year the Leafs last won the Stanley Cup. 1972, Canada wins the Summit Series. 1982, I moved to Brazil. 1990, the year I got married. 1992, first of back-to-back -back World Series wins for the Jays. 1994, the birth of my son Joshua. 1999, the year of the birth of my daughter Rebecca. 2001. September 11. In 2004, my first television broadcast. 2019, the year the Raptors won their first NBA championship. Isaiah also dated a great event in his life by a year. He remembers the specific year because he begins by giving us that in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died. Now, you may ask, well, why was that an important year? Well, something happened that year that allowed Isaiah to be able to get his diary down, turn a certain page and date, even to the hour and the minute and point exactly where he was when that happened to him. What happened was so incredible to Isaiah. What was that? He says in verse 1, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne. The edges of his robe filled the temple. He says again in verse 5, I've seen the king, the Lord of heavenly forces. Isaiah had come face to face with the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the Lord of this universe. Can I tell you, just an opinion, more than anything else in this world, Canada needs a fresh vision of God. The church needs a fresh vision of God. You need a fresh vision of God. I need a fresh vision of God. For once it becomes just the king and you or the king and I, you will not and cannot ever be the same again. As we think about the king, let me hopefully get you to see the king through the eyes of this great prophet so you can see him correctly and know him intimately. Now notice how Isaiah describes the king that he saw. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, the edges of his robe filling the temple. Now, I want you to notice the word Lord in that verse. You notice it, I don't know, in your translation, but it's lowercase letters. But when you go down to verse 3, look again, you'll see that the word Lord there is in uppercase letters. Now, there's a reason for that. The word Lord in the Old Testament, when it is in lowercase, is usually the Hebrew word Adonai, which literally means the sovereign one. Now, this is not the name of the Lord. It is the title for God. In fact, it is the supreme title given to God in the Old Testament. When you see the word Lord in the uppercase, that is the name Yahweh. That is the sacred name for God. 
So understand this, Lord is the name of God while Lord is the title of God. One uppercase, one lowercase. The title given to God in the Old Testament was Lord, Adonai, the sovereign one. This was a name that was reserved for God alone. But who is this Lord that was sitting on a throne? Well, the Apostle John quotes verses 9 and 10 of this chapter in John chapter 12 and verse 40. And then in verse 41, he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory. He spoke about Jesus. The Lord sitting on the throne in the Old Testament is none other than Jesus in the New Testament. But you see the, you see the contrast. The earthly throne was empty, but the heavenly throne was full. Did you know that heaven's throne is never unoccupied? Psalm 45, verse 6, Your divine throne is eternal and everlasting. You see, <clears throat> there are two kings that are seen in verse 1. One is a dead king, and one is a divine king. One is a mortal king, one is an immortal king. One is a human king, one is a heavenly king. One king had died, as all kings do, but one king lives forever, as no other king can. Now, these were troubled days for Isaiah and the nation of Judah. Isaiah, a good king, Isaiah's friend, had died. Judah was facing invasion from the Assyrian army from the north. Things looked very bleak. Someone has well said, when the outlook is bleak, try the uplook. When Isaiah looked up, he saw clearly what you and I need to see completely in these troubled times in which we live. And that is this God. This God is on the throne. His hand is on the throttle. He is in complete control. I mean, we be, may face terrorist attacks, increasing persecution, spiritual hostility, but God is on the throne. When a plane hits a tower, God is in control. When the doctor says you have cancer, God is in control. When the boss says you're fired, God is on the throne and God is in control. But something more is said about this king. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. Winged creatures were stationed around him. Each had six wings. With two they veiled their faces, with two their feet, and with two they flew about. They shouted to each other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heavenly forces. All the earth is filled with God's glory. Now, you're going to learn in one sentence the single most important thing you can ever learn about God, and that is his chief attribute. What it is that really makes God God. These seraphim were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Seven out of every 12 references to the name of God in the Old Testament refer to him as holy. God's name is qualified by the adjective holy in the Old Testament more often than all of the other adjectives in the Old Testament put together. You see, the chief attribute of God is not power. The seraphim were not crying out, omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipotent is the Lord of hosts. The chief attribute of God is not perception. They were not crying out, omniscient, omniscient, omniscient is the Lord of hosts. The chief attribute of God is not presence. They were not crying out, omnipresent, omnipresent, omnipresent is the Lord of hosts. The chief 
attribute of God is purity. That is why they were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holiness is not something that God is, nor is it something that God does. It is something that God is. It is a unique holiness. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 2 says, No one is holy like the Lord. No one except you. There is no rock like our God. Now, I don't have to tell you that we are to praise God or we are to worship God. We are to exalt God. Do you know the primary reason why we are to do these things? Look at Psalm 99 and verse 5. Magnify the Lord our God, bow low at his footstool, he is holy. Incidentally, do you know why the word holy is repeated three times in Hebrew poetry? You see, it is repetition. Repetition is the method used in Hebrew poetry to emphasize something. When we want to emphasize the importance of something in English, we either we underline it, we put it in italics, we put it in boldface type, we put an exclamation point following it. But the Jewish people, in order to indicate emphasis, use the method of repetition. When you mention something three times in succession, it was to elevate it to a superlative degree and give it the greatest importance. Only once in all the Bible is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. Only once is a character trait of God mentioned three times in succession. The Bible does not say that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It says he is holy, holy, holy. You will never know God as God, as he is to be known, or see God as he is to be seen until you know him and see him as the holy God. Now notice immediately Isaiah's reaction. Isaiah 6, verses 4 and 5. The door frame shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. I said, mourn for me, I am ruined. I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the king, the Lord of heavenly forces. When Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness, he saw himself in his sinfulness and the people in their wickedness. Here is an important lesson to learn. We will never see ourselves for what we really are until we see God for who he really is. There are actually three people sitting in your seat right now. There is the person you hope you are. There is the person other people think you are. And then there is the person that God knows you are. If you would ask people on the street what they thought of Isaiah, they would have told you he was a man of unquestioned integrity, moral righteousness, the epitome of holiness and a paragon of virtue. But just one look at a holy God is all it took to reveal how sinful Isaiah really was. It took deity to reveal dirtiness. It took God to reveal guilt. You see, the more you know of God, the less you will think of yourself. It is interesting to see how the Apostle Paul felt about himself. The more he got to know God, in fact, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 9, look at what Paul said. He said, I am the least of the apostles. Seven years later, as he had obviously grown, and he now knew the Lord better and better, he says in Ephesians chapter 3 
And in verse 8, he says, I am the least of all the saints. Three years later, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he said, of all sinners, I am the chief. Immediately upon seeing the king, Isaiah cries out in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, mourn for me, I am ruined, I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the king, the Lord of heavenly forces. The word undone in Hebrew literally means to unravel. You know, I heard the story of a five-year-old boy that went down to Florida for the first time and he got sunburned. A few days later, his skin begins peeling off. He ran into the bedroom to his mother and said, Mommy, look at me. I'm five years old and coming apart already. When Isaiah saw the king, he, he says, I am coming apart. I am unraveling. Many years ago, the time of, Times of London ran a series of letters to the editor on the subject, what is wrong with the world? This stimulated great interest over an extended period and received many inquiries. Many highly respected people wrote their views, which were duly printed and avidly read by thousands of people. But one day a letter appeared from the great Christian philosopher G.K. Chesterton. Here's what he wrote. To the editor of the Times of London, you ask what is wrong with the world? I am. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton's letter ended the correspondence because everyone realized he had hit the nail on the head. But the news does get better. Because immediately after Isaiah confesses his sin, God moves into action. Isaiah 6, verses 6 and 7. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed and your sin is removed. A seraphim takes a blazing white-hot coal off the altar, altar and touches the lips of the prophet and cleanses him. Now, the reason why he touched his lips and not his heart is because of what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 34. Children of snakes, how can you speak good things while you are evil? What fills the heart comes out of the mouth. Isaiah had a dirty mouth because he had a dirty heart. But these seraphim, which literally means flame bearers, touch his lips with a hot coal and it cleanses him of his sin. God is holy, but God is also merciful. It is so beautiful to see time after time after time in the Bible that when you confess your sinfulness, God springs into action and activates his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now notice exactly what happens in Isaiah 6, verse 8. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom should I send and who will go for us? I said, I'm here, send me. Isaiah is now so close to God, he could eavesdrop on a, converse, on a conference call between the Trinity you see, the Lord was just not talking to himself. He said, who will go for us? This was a conference call between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is now raising a question. He wants Isaiah to hear. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Now, this is so beautiful because after confession comes the cleansing. But after the cleansing comes the calling. 
You see, God does not demand a perfect vessel, but he does demand a clean vessel. Now notice Isaiah's response. Here I am. Here am I. Send me. Do you know how many times Christians answer the question when God says, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? The average Christian does not say, here am I, send me. The average Christian says, there he is, send him. Isaiah didn't say, send the pastor. He didn't say, send the missionary. He didn't say, send that seminary trained professional. He didn't say, here am I, but send anybody except me. He said, here am I. Send me. Let me tell you why the greatest need in the church and the greatest need of the vast majority of Christians in this world is to get a fresh vision of God. When you contemplate the holiness of God and you confess your sinfulness to God and receive forgiveness from God, you will want to be committed to the usefulness of God. Do you notice when God asked the question, Who, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah didn't say, well, that depends on where do you want me to go. He didn't say, well, that depends on what you want me to do. Isaiah signed the contract before the contract was even typed. Notice something else. He didn't say, here I am. He said, here am I. Now, there's a big difference. Had he simply said, here I am, that would have just indicated his location. But he was not interested in just giving God his location. He wanted to find his vocation. That's why he said, here am I. In other words, he was saying to God, look no further. Send me wherever you lead, I'll go. Whatever you ask, I will do whatever you want, I will give. And immediately, immediately God says to Isaiah in verse 9, go and say to this people. Now notice carefully the people to whom Isaiah was to go was the people among whom he lived. You know what God is saying to every one of us today? He's saying, go where you are. Speak to whomever will listen, whether it is your next door neighbor, the teammate at pickup hockey, the woman at the checkout counter, the secretary behind the desk, or the client you're trying to serve. You'll have no problem doing that when you see the king. God is saying to those of us who are alive this moment, and who have truly seen the king, take death to yourself and go tell the dead of this world right now where you live, that the king is coming. Because the king and I, or the king and you, can make an incredible difference in this world. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we humbly ask as we come before your throne that you grant us a glimpse of your holiness that we may better understand our sinfulness. Father, forgive us of our sins and send us to share with others this bounty that you have so graciously provided for each one of us. Father, bless each and every viewer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. Thank you so much for watching. And if you could help us get the word out on our program, and let your friends and family know that we're on and that they too can tune in. Now, if you happen to have family that lives outside of the geographical area where our program broadcasts primarily, that's okay. 
what you can do is you can refer them to our website, l4ltv.com. Under the previous programs tab, every single program we have ever aired is accessible there. So they can go through that and they can see every program just like you are watching right now. That's l4ltv.com. On the website, there are some interesting resources. There's a tab called Archived Sermons, different presentations we've done around the country, live presentations. You can watch those. You can download a uh, handout if you want to study that topic a little bit more. There's also a page where you can donate. You can make a donation to our ministry. We are a charitable organization, so you will get a receipt for income tax purposes. Hey, follow me on Instagram, Santos underscore Bill. Every morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time, a one-minute devotional goes out to help you get your day started. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe to our SoundCloud page. Uh, like our Facebook page. In the final in moments, but just before we go, hey, remember to check out our missionnowcanada.com website, which is the humanitarian aspect of our ministry. We are all out of time. Hey, check those pages out. We hope to do this again next time. God bless you. We hope to see you back here again.